do you understand? I've been long-winded, um, so I appreciate everyone sticking with me. I know this is a pretty he he heady topic. A couple of things that come built in with NSO. Yeah, one of them is called NCS NetSim. Um, batteries included programmability options. Sometimes we need something to automate against, uh, but we don't necessarily have a lab or have an ability to get into that lab or maybe someone's using it. NCS NetSim allows us to instantiate control plane only um, models of a network device completely in memory based on how that net operates. So I can't connect these devices together. So it's not like a GNS3 or an EVNG or, or, or CML where I can connect those devices and pass packets. It's only a control plane representation, but um, it allows me to perform configuration uh, using NSO against those devices without having a real device. So I can test my automations, I can test my services in a, in a very, uh, ephemeral sandbox that I can create and destroy as needed. Um, the device does require a NED, so you have to have a NED to instantiate that that NCS NetSim device. Um, but once you have that NED, you can you can instantiate as many of those devices as you have memory, really, and they're very very lightweight. Uh, and I've got a demo of that um, when I get to it. Um, it snaps into the NSO CLI, so once I instantiate a NetSim network. Uh, those devices automatically get imported into NSO, so I need to worry about any device inventory management or anything like that, and it scales bigly. And some people will say, well, well, why don't we have live devices? Why don't we have a real data plane? Uh, you know, why can't we just provide that connectivity? It's actually very hard in the hood, um, but even more important to the point, uh, I love this quote, um, and it's uh, this, uh, quote by a gentleman by the name of John von Neumann, who was probably one of the last great polymaths um, of the 20th century. So he not only dealt with uh, number theory, but also dealt with, with uh, real life application of mathematics. So it was both the theory and the real life application. And he had this quote that says, there's no sense in being precise when you don't even know what you're talking about. And that rings very true, especially to me uh, when working and starting with NSO. If you don't know what the end state is going to be, why are we going to spend all the resources and, and trying to figure out something that you may not even need to, to use at the end of the day? And so we don't need to have, we don't need to let the, the perfect be the enemy of the good enough. And that's where NSO fills that sweet spot. Now, it's part of a larger DevOps tool chain. So, you know, I know Hank has spoken at length about this at you know, Cisco Live and other conferences where, you know, he'll use NCS NetSim on his laptop to do a real quick and dirty uh, test of, of some kind of service that's modeled in the network. And, okay, okay, I've got it working on these devices. I'm pretty close. Now let's go apply this to a, a CML or some other simulated network. Um, and I can take those same services and apply them towards those real devices. But I've done all that nitty gritty, that testing. And if I'm doing a large scale automation, um, that's a lot of resources that could be consumed while I'm doing all that testing that may not need to be consumed. Um, so really, I, again, like I said, this quote just sticks with me and I will uh, I'll repeat it probably until I, uh, I get tired of automation. But um, that's the whole reason for NCS NetSim. It's just a way to do it with some quick and dirty testing and validation without having to have access to a real lab. So I'll talk about real quickly about services and then uh, I can jump into the actual demo itself. So when we talk about services, uh, there's a lot of different ways that we can interact with NSO. There's no right or wrong way. Some people stick with the CLI, some people want to go API, some people want to use the web UI. Um, there's no right or wrong way, it's a platform. Um, it's a really awesome automation platform that you have to build a lot of it yourself. Um, there uh, is the concept of templates. So when we build templates, you can create a top level. Um, this is what I want every device to be. So you can onboard a device in the device manager and apply the template that has, I don't know, things like SNMP, DHCP, um, sorry, not DHCP, uh, DNS settings. Um, maybe you've got some specific uh, syslog trapping, um, AAA configuration, those kinds of things. You can do that with a template and just apply it directly to a device when it's onboarded and be done with it. Um, it's a way to, to automate a lot of that that top matter, that that infrastructure management piece that, you know, everyone's got that uh, text document says, oh, copy and paste this on a new router kind of thing. You can build re resource facing and customer facing services and you can use actions. Um, and we'll touch a little bit on each of those later. So so generally what happens is is there's three stages, and I know this is highly idealized, but there's three stages of net so engagement. Network engineers are going to start with, how can I automate some of the tasks that are error prone? How can I use a single CLI? How do I get the those goodies, that configuration rollback, snapshotting, two-stage commit, uh, being able to operate on multiple devices from a single point? They're going to use that CLI and, and 
basic automation of templates and things like that within NSO to get immediate value out of that. Once you get to that second stage, you're talking about how can we make this, um, uh, how can our ops and provisioning teams use this? So instead of having to have the ops team or, or the provisioning team, um, you know, come in, you know, interacting with those teams, oh, we need a new server, or we need a new X or Y, um, and having to open a ticket with the network engineers working on that and then um, having them apply the configuration, we can start making things that are, are, there's specific ops services or ops scripts that can be run to simplify that task and minimize the amount of ticketing going back and forth. Um, and again, because you've automated that orchestration, you've automated that assurance, and you know that it's going to work, it's the same every time. So you don't have those snowflakes. You don't have the data center melting down because someone made a bunch of snowflakes in there. The third piece is the service developers, and this is where you accelerate the time to market through very complex automations and developing your own services. There's that's a that's a, a big lift. I mean, even some of the TMEs inside the NSOBU, like they struggle with developing large scale complex services because there's a lot of pieces there. Some people are really good at it, and others there's um but you know most people will sit in these first two buckets that use nso and they can be completely happy with using nso in those two use cases and get a lot of value at it because it has simplified the network operations and orchestration of their of their infrastructure much more than having a bunch of disparate vendor products doing the same thing now we talked a little bit about service types. So there's a customer facing service, and this is something that a product that a user wishes to con uh, consume. So think of this as being like the MPLS L3 VPNs. Maybe you're adding an ACI or VXLAN tenant. Maybe you're standing up a, 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 a an Amazon VPC and having a bunch of EC2 instances with some S3 storage. Those are user or customer facing services, things that users will consume. A resource facing service is something that's going to be, what would an engineer consume? I need to do this this top matter template, or I need to create the underlay for that VXLAN fabric so we can have new people on top of it, um, looking at, at hardening of a device based on, on industry compliance standards. So you'll sometimes hear those terms. It's not like we're doing two different things. It's just how who is going to be consuming those services and how we design those services for those people to consume them. Uh, real quick, SDLC here, because we're wrapping up towards the end of the, demo, of the presentation. Um, Basically, like any other uh, idea that you would develop in code, you have an idea, you write a pseudocode model, um, you build those blueprints of, of that service, you start creating those models and iterating over the Yang and creating the structure. We build the template in code, which is the, the XML template and, and whatever Pythonic or, or Java code we want to have associated with that. And we deploy the service and then we iterate over this, the top of it. Um, and then it just, it's a constant repeat uh, because you're always fixing and iterating on the services. All right, and that takes me to the end of the presentation and on to the sandbox. And we'll be, if you haven't explored this, we do have a DevNet sandbox inside of the, um, I'm sorry, an NSO sandbox inside of DevNet sandbox that comes to fault with two different installations of NSO. There is a, uh, NSO is two different ways of being installed. One's a production or system install, which is a little bit, if you were to be deploying this in, um, in your enterprise or organization, there are some some caveats that come with that. So normally what people do, especially for testing, is they'll use the local install, which just means you've installed it in a Linux uh, host or a Mac uh, for your own user. And that's the one I'm gonna be uh, working with because it's the easiest to get started with. You don't have to worry about all of the different Linux level um, permissions and things like that. On top of that, we have this network that's uh, instantiated. We've got some hosts, we've got some Nexus switches, some XC routers, some XR routers, some firewalls. And then this is a recent addition where they have this dev tools box running NetBox and GitLab uh, for CICD and being able to populate single sources of truth. So it's really an all encompassing uh, uh, sandbox to take you from, I'm starting with NSO all the way through complex northbound API integrations with, with uh, CI runners and things like that. So. I'm going to end that presentation because that's really about it. Yep, sweet. Any questions before I get started here? I have a small question. <laughs> let's see, let's see. Sure. So uh, thanks for that for, uh, to start with because uh, it's really, you. I, I'm hearing NSO, NSO. Andrian was the first that uh, mentioned it to me and uh, I was uh, looking for ways to uh, do uh, synchronize things with uh, uh, NetConf and Yang and stuff like that. And uh, that was the answer that Andrian gave me. And so I was looking about it uh, since then. So um, I figured it, it's a software package, right? But I never uh, thought that the scale would be so big. Uh, 
So what I'm getting at is that uh, you mentioned the local Linux install, so that should be not too big, right? But on the other hand, you mentioned uh, simulations and stuff like that. So how do those things go together? I mean, isn't this supposed to be big to be able to handle that stuff? Can you really do okay, a local installation? Uh, well, so so well, so the, the, the oh, that's the question. Well, so, so okay, yeah. So um, if you're just messing around with it locally, um, so I've got a bunch of versions on my laptop. It's just a standard uh, MacBook, sixteen gigs of RAM, that kind of thing. For for basic tooling around, it's absolutely okay. Local install resources. You're you're probably going to run out of um, you're probably going to run out of time before you run out of memory for for those kinds of things. Um, <laughs> The, the dev box here in in the devnet sandbox i think is is eight maybe 16 gigs of ram and a few cores so again it's nothing beefy um for 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 local you know for for playing and tootling around with it not a big deal now if you're running a big service provider style installation there's a lot more involved with that you're going to be running a system install and there are rough um sizing guides but you know, this the NSO being a bare metal install on top of Linux, um, you know, with all the clustering and databases and things like that. I mean, we're talking for, for large scale installations, a cluster of three to five UCSC 240s um, with lots of cores and memory, um, you know, gigs and gig, you know, several hundreds of gigs of memory uh, to be able to operate in that. Again, because everything is, is, is running from memory. The CDB is stored in memory, which makes it fast, but it means you need to have a lot of it. Um, so the, the software itself can scale, um, but you need to make sure you provide the underlying platforms that can scale with it. Still very impressive, though. Yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing piece of software. Hey, hey uh, the, what do you use for um, automation now, Ioannis? Well, uh, that, that's a bitter question. At last bigger, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Bitter, no. Not bigger. <laughs> so, um, okay, let me give you some perspective. Uh, so, uh, I work for the Bank of Greece. Uh, I'm the head of the NOC there. Uh, we're four engineers uh, doing everything, uh, meaning everything in network wise. So, we handle all the NMS and uh, uh, CLI and uh, performance management and uh, whatever. So, um, we use automation in order to make our lives easier. So that means that uh, we have small holes that we want to cover, uh, where we want to be more productive, and we aim all our efforts there. So I was the first to dig in about four or five years ago, and the rest are slowly coming in. Uh, another colleague has started two years ago, and we've published stuff together. So mostly we use Python, of course. We, uh, I'm using, uh, and she's using a lot of Nornir. Uh, we do stuff like, uh, figure out that the uh, route has gone missing somewhere in the network and uh, do it quickly. But we, we have other tools as well that we base ourselves on too. So we have Cisco Prime and we do a lot of automation with Prime. We've uh, implemented uh, Netbox a couple of years ago. We started and we're slowly getting there. So we're using Netbox as well. Uh, we're trying to uh, collaborate data, you know, and uh, figure out where stuff is uh, going out of sync between uh, Cisco Prime and uh, Netbox, and uh, possibly also in the network, meaning for VLANs, for example, stuff like that. So a lot of uh, NetMeco, a lot of uh, uh, Nornir, but uh, not a lot of uh, NetConf yet, because our boxes are uh, a little bit older, like the workhorses that uh, uh, Quinn mentioned earlier. So we're getting there. Uh, NetConf is... Um, Next on my uh, on my list, and uh, mostly for model driven telemetry, I've been waiting for the next batch of equipment where we'll have uh, switches as well as routers. Our routers now can support NetCon, but right. it's not enough uh, for me to put uh, that much effort into it and uh, do everything uh, with NetCon. But I, I would say that's that's the way forward because you you're really uh, using the the data as it's modeled. I, 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 Think of it like there's no in-betweens, you know, because if you're using SSH, you're constantly parsing to get to the data, and that way you, you don't need to parse anymore. It's more reliable in my view. So uh, this is where we are. We're trying to get there. I think a lot of people are in the same spot. Yeah. Uh, NSO was uh, the first thing I came uh, 
I came up with when I was trying to find what to do uh, to synchronize stuff and do stuff in parallel. And uh, th that was the answer I got. It's not uh, open source like I would like to, but uh, still, uh, I think um, there's a lot into it. There's, there's a lot about, uh, we could uh, gain from it. Hey, I, I want to invite you back for another lengthy conversation. Would you would you join again? I don't know what time it is there, but uh, but I want to I want to continue this because uh, you you dropped some things yeah, just yeah. now that I want to expand on. Is that good? Sure, sure. no okay. problem. And uh, you can talk to me later, and we can organize stuff. Awesome. Thank. You. Go go ahead. Sorry, Quinn. Go ahead. All yours. Yeah, no worries. Hopefully, I can get this done in about the next half hour or so. So I appreciate everyone uh, staying on. I know, like I said, I I love to hear my own voice, especially I've got these in your monitors that are picking up all the tones from my mic. So um, keep doing you. With if, anybody, if anybody um, to drop, I'm recording this. So don't worry about it. This is great information. So if your wife is calling you or your husband's calling you, go ahead. Uh, you can watch it later. All right. So um, what I've done here is uh, this is just a standard uh, VS Code remote SSH uh, to the dev box sitting inside of the um, NSO sandbox that I reserved through through DevNet. A uh, couple of things here. I created this folder called init six source, and then I have just to keep things handy for me. Um, I have a few files that I, I pre-populated in here. One of them I want to touch on, and, and I use a lot when I'm dealing with NSO, is this make file. So if you're not familiar with GNU make, um, it's just a real simple way to have commands that can execute further shell scripts. So a lot of it is is built in, and I can make this a little bit bigger if you guys are. Um, kind of make it a little bit easier to read here. Um, the uh, uh, it's just a way that I can chain together multiple commands inside of a single nested piece. So a lot of people, if you compile things from source, you know they say you know make compile and make and all that kind of stuff. It's running these sets of scripts to make sure that you can install that piece of software. Well, you can use that really generally for anything, and it's a very simple use case. But I always forget the, the string of commands to do like NCS setup and, and copy in all my packages and make sure that I've got the NEDs in right and that I've declared the NETSIM directory appropriately. Um, I have one for cleaning, so if I need to remove the package and, or remove the, the state of the, the uh, system and start over, I can do that. Uh, something if I'm designing packages, I'll do like an echo, uh, make reload, which is just reloading the, the service packages that I've designed. The other important piece here is is the netsim pieces. So I have a netsim and a netsim clean. This NCS netsim will bootstrap three iOS devices running in the Cisco iOS CLI 6.67 net, um, and then we'll start that netsim simulation. Then I can remove that here. Finally, if I just do a make clean, it'll do an NSO clean and a netsim clean for everything. So. Uh, I have this up and running, and the first thing after I get into this is is uh, I'll get into the netsim. So I've already pre-run this. So if I do NCS netsim uh, is alive, you can see I've got those three devices that I've instantiated per my my make file, and they're up and functioning. Uh, we can also do an NCS netsim list, and this gives me the the information. Pull this over a little bit of of those uh, instances of the NetSim devices. So for everything that I instantiate with NetSim, I'm given a NetConf port, an SNMP port, uh, and a CLI port directly that I can communicate with with that host. So I have full northbound reachability with that NetSim, that virtualized uh, uh, con uh, control plane only model sitting on this box right now. So it gives me a lot of, of flexibility, not only to use NSO to, to build this, but to do other things with it if I need to. Uh, and most importantly, if I do NCS NetSim CLI C iOS, and let's do zero, I have just dropped into the configuration or the, the, the SSH session of that device that is, is like I said, is that control plane simulation. So you can see there's some configurations already applied. We have some gig ethers, some fast ethers. There's a loopback in there, and there's some basic IP configuration. So we already have some configuration that's been populated as part of that device that's already there just by running the NCS NetSim command. So this gives me some devices that I can mess with um, and show and demonstrate some things without even having to use something like CML to do the heavy lifting. So now that... I've shown that. Let me go ahead and close this make file here, and I'll just expand this a little bit bigger. 
if I want to get into the actual NSO CLI, I'll do NSO NCS underscore CLI dash C for Cisco. Uh, and everything is by default in the admin. So now I've logged into NCS. Uh, network control system, which is what the name was before it was NSO. Um, in here, I can look at the, and what other piece here, we're used to the tab completion, but if I get close to a word and just hit space, it will automatically fill in by default. You can change that setting, but you'll see things that I just hit space and it'll tab over instead of having to hit tab. I can do a show devices list here, so I can see that I have those devices already added as part of my um, uh, my NetSim. So when I run a NetSim and reference that NetSim directory in starting NCS, I will get those devices automatically added to my um, uh, automatically added to my, to my device manager. Now, some of the bootstrap files that I want to share with you guys as well is. I want to be able to add the devices to the, the running devices in CML uh, that's backing this, um, uh, you know, the, the topology that we're showing. I wanted to be able to add these devices to NSO very quickly. And I could type all these things by hand and have it come out and, and hopefully it works. But I've created this inventory file so that now, well, so I've got the inventory and I have this auth group, which defines all of the usernames and passwords of those devices. And then I can put each of those devices into groupings. And I'm going to kill that because it will fail. Um, so what I could, I've got these pre-populated. So now I can just do, it should just be an R load. Oh no, so load merge. Config load merge. And this is gonna be in the helper directory. And I wanna load the auth groups. So now I've just taken that file and because NCS is operating on top of the Linux operating system, I can do file operations in this utility. So what I've done is I've just merged that off group configuration into the running scratch pad of NSO. If I do a show config, you can see that it's created this, but it has not applied it yet. If I try to exit out of here and say, hey, you have uncommitted changes, what do you want to do with them? I'm going to cancel because here I can do a commit and it will apply that configuration to NCS. So now that has been applied. I have that auth group. So if I were to exit here, I can do a show devices, device, should be under auth group. There is the printed show. Oh, I bet it's not, anyway, I'll, I'll show something else here in a second. So now I can do the same thing for, uh, let's see here, do load merge and we'll load in the, uh, what's that called? Device inventory. So now you can see that I've got each of these devices loaded up. They've been uh, in, added into the scratch pad. If I do a commit here, takes a second and exit. If I do a show devices list, you can now see that I've got each of those devices added into my CDB. From here, I can do a devices sync from. This is gonna pull in the configuration of all of those devices as it's sitting on um, or as is running right now on each of those devices instead of CML. So it's gonna go out, use the uh, SSH, connect all those individual devices, pull those configurations down. So once they're added in and I do a sync from, they now have a snapshot in the configuration database that I can use as a point in time reference. So if anything breaks, I can roll back or roll forward or do whatever I need to. So after you execute it, <laughs> after you execute config change, do you have to do that config sync to make sure that you have their updated configuration? No, so so once if I do all my configurations through NSO, it's automatically synced. Yeah, okay, they're always kept in sync. If I do a change, what I was going to demonstrate next here uh, in a second, actually, um, was making a change on a device without NSO, and then showing what that looks like, and then rolling back or rolling forward. So you can see it was able to grab all the configs off of all those devices. Now I don't just have um, <clears throat> I don't just have 
access to the devices through NSO, I can execute any arbitrary command um, on a device, dist router 01, live status, exec, any show version. So this command right here is going to go out and it's going to interrogate dist router 01, which is an iOS XE device, and execute a show version command and pull back the data. So we can see that it is actually doing what it's supposed to. It is a uh, 611.1b CSR1000b. It's been up for about three days, which is when I made the reservation. Um, and you can see all the individual pieces here. So I can interact with these devices one by one through uh, NSO without having to do any other, you know, any other fancy stuff behind it. So that's the basics that come with that. So now, if I wanted to do something like maybe configuration management. So let's do um, a show running config devices device. Uh, we'll do dist router one config and pipe that to display. So what this is doing, and I, I know some of these configs are long, you kind of get used to how NSO is, is formatting the syntax here, but what I'm essentially doing is showing the running config of this dist router 01 device. But remember back to the presentation where everything that was running config was parsed inside of that config bracket um, in, the, in the slide. Let me pull it up here. If we go back to this X path. You can see everything is part of this config portion. Well, we want to make sure that we're showing when we do a show configuration or show running config by default, if we just do that, that's all of the configuration of the device. So as it pertains to NSO, as well as the configuration data, so config and opera data, as well as how NSO is interpreting it. We only want to see the config level data, what's running on that device right now, which is why I have that separate piece of config. Pipe display is, is you know, the pipe is doing what we normally would expect it to do, but we can display that configuration in a variety of outputs. So we can get back to our XPath, and we can see all of that devices running config in XPath notation. Just to show you that XPath and XML are fairly similar, we can get that, and I'll break out of this real quick. Here's our iOS, or here's our, um, our namespace, which is that URN iOS, hey, goes back to what was in that presentation, that slide there, and we can look at this host name piece. So we have this host name, that's in, ensconced in devices, device, name, config, and then host name. Well, let's go back up to the, this piece here, device, devices, name, config, host name. You can see the relationship between the XML output and the XPath output. They're one and the same, just different ways of displaying them. So we don't have to look through all the tags, we can just have a single line variable or a single line for each of those different pieces. Um, going back here, I'll just do one more here because everyone loves to see JSON data. This is fully parsed configuration data as NSO sees it into JSON format. So we can see that it's using this tailf ned Cisco iOS, and here's the different um, uh, pieces of all that. So you can, it's very much parsed into key value pairs. Hey, here's our uh, domain name, viral.info. Well, if we go back to the, the running config, that's been parsed, you know, that is viral.info. So now you have this, this key value pair parse JSON that you can use to extract as well. So it's done all this parsing. As soon as we imported that configuration, it's an, all that parsing, just like PyETS would, but it's doing it in NSO itself. So we have a pretty cool way of displaying all of this configuration. Now what I'm going to do here is... Oh, that's what I was going to do. So let me open up a new terminal window here. And I'm going to SSH to that, um, that router that we're working on, that this router 01. So if we do show run and include NTP, there is no NTP configured on that device. Oops. If we go back to this NCSCLI here, Say I want to add an apply or apply a configuration of an NTP server to that device. So we'll do enter config mode. We'll do devices, device, dist router, oh, dist router, oh, one, uh, config data, NTP server, 10, 10, 10, 10. 
So that configuration is there. If I do a show config, it has not applied it yet, but it's sitting in the scratch pad. Now, the other cool part about NSO is I can do a, this thing called a commit dry run. And this is going to say, can you commit this to the device? Is this syntax going to work before you commit it? And But don't actually do anything. Just make sure it can be accepted. We can look at different out formats of this data. And so we can look at this as a CLI output, a native output, or XML. The XML is important, and I'll show why in a second. So from a CLI perspective, this is what's being added to that device. How it's being, how it's looked at from the NCS CLI, I should say. If we do an out format of native, this is going to be what would be configured on the uh, router itself using Cisco CLI. But we can out format this in XML. And this becomes important because as we start building our services, we want to make sure that our names, we, we align all of our XML in the correct way for our templates. So we can display this as that XML data that's going to be sent to the config database, just like we would be if it was a, a we're using a NetConf session or something similar to that. So we know, let's do a commit. So we, we, we know each of these is working because the commit dry run is working. So now if we hit commit, We do connect to the device, applies the configuration, commit complete. We go back to that SSH session here, we show run pipe I NTP. We now have an NTP server. So we can see that we've used an NSO as to apply configuration towards that end device. Now going back to well, what if we didn't really want to do that? Say we just nuked BGP um, and we want to fix it. Well, we have this whole idea of having a configuration rollback. So we can do, if we exit out of all this, let's just go to the top. We can do rollback configuration. So those are all the possible configurations that have been stored in the system since we started. Now, some of these are, are uh, instantiations of adding the NetSim devices. Some of them are adding devices to the, when we did that sync from action, we have a bunch of these different configuration um, snapshots that are stored in the CDB. We do know based on timing, you can see that some of these were added. So uh, some of these were added like right here. These are the, the syncs that were happening with the, um, adding those devices to the CLI. We know that this is that change that we just made through NSO. So we can either do 10016 or we can just do configuration rollback or rollback configuration, hit enter. So now we've applied that configuration to our scratch pad inside of NSO. We can do show config. We can see that it has said, well, in order to get us back from what the configuration was that we applied, we have to enter a no. It knows that because of how the net has been designed. So this is, would be the configuration that would be applied to that device if we want to apply it. Well, let's do a commit dry run. Okay, everything was good. And we can see in this universal diff style, in fact, if we scroll back up here, we can see that, that those pluses were things that were going to be added as part of that configuration change initially. Now we can see that they're going to be removed. So we have a diff style syntax within NSO to say what's changed and what hasn't. All right, let's commit it. Commit complete. We go back to our session. And it's gone. So we've rolled that back all the way through NSO. Now, what happens if, you know, someone like Derek gets a wild hair and says, I want to configure an NTP server because I needed it there and we want to, I, I'm going to put it back. And I, no one can tell me otherwise. So he goes in and configures an NTP server, and just for RINs, we'll keep this at 10.9.9.9. Um, okay, so if we do a show run, we see we have an NTP server, nothing fancy there. Well, how will we figure this out inside of NSO? Well, we can do a devices, device, disk router, one, check, sync. Hmm. Something's out of sync here. So we were able to conf we, we were able to use NSO to say, let's check what we have on our CDB versus what's on the device. It doesn't have to pull the full configuration, but let's check. We're out of sync because we got a we we received a hash that was different than what we were expecting from what we had inside the CDB. Let's um let's do this. Let's figure out what changed. So we can do devices, device, dist router 01. 
Let's compare config and let's look at it out format CLI. Oh, using this, we were able to say, let's compare what's in our CDB versus what's in the device. And using that, we can see that there is this NTP server that's been added. Okay. If we want to, we can either do a uh, we can either do a sync, um, sorry, this router one. So we have these two little options at the very bottom here, sync from and a sync to. So someone's made a change to the device. We want to make sure that we either say that's a good change, even though they didn't do it through NSO, we wanted to make sure that uh, it's applied to our CDB. We can sync from just like we did earlier, where we're going to pull that configuration in and sync it into the CDB. So now we're back in sync. Or we can say, Derek, I told you, no NTP servers, and we can do a sync too, which is going to synchronize our currently running configuration inside of the CDB back to that device. So if I do a sync to, I type it, it take a second. So, so sync from can be a little bit tricky if you have more than one engineer working on a device and you decide to say, okay, I made the changes and then sync from, but you didn't account for changes that somebody else made, right? Correct. Yeah, um, it doesn't fix, um, NSO doesn't fix bad change management processes. It can, it can make them easier because we have a single source of truth, but it doesn't fix bad process. Okay. But we, but again, we can look at those, what changed in those configurations by doing that compare config and say, oh, well, that's, I expected this, but I didn't expect this. What happened and why? So now I did that, uh, I don't know if we all saw that. So I went, we saw that that uh, sync two is true. Everything is good. So now if I go back to this SSH session, I have no more NTP server. So this is again, this is all out of the box. There's nothing fancy going on here. This is just using NSO as configuration management and uh, 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 syncing all that to the, the configuration database. So I'm almost at the, the kind of the heavy part here. Is there any questions so far? What application or a program are you using to pull this screen up? Uh, this is just Visual Studio Code. Okay. Kind of the de facto, I think what everybody's kind of settled on, um, at least internally within DevNet. Um, it's nice because we can do terminal windows. I can do this remote SSH. So this is actually connecting. I'm locally on my system, but I'm connecting back to the, the box in the sandbox. Um, as Git integration, I can do things with, you know, syntax highlighting and all kinds of really cool stuff. This is, well, it's, it's, it's visual code, right? What is, uh, what's the name? VS code? Is that what it is? Yeah, v visual studio code. Yeah, so if you actually, and, and guys, uh, somebody had the question before that that was um, on the link, where do I go to get access to this? Let's, let's, uh, the sandbox, developer.cisco.com. Uh, you can go up there and you get access to this, but also, uh, uh, and this goes back to the question you just asked, there are also tutorials on how to use these tools that he's using. Um, so it, it, it walks you through uh, installation. It walks you through getting it set up. Um, so just, please, developer.cisco.com. Go ahead, sorry, Quinn. Back to you. Yeah, no worries, no worries. We'll get to the we'll get to this last piece here, and and this is really what I want to show is the power of NSO. So, I talked a lot about services, and everyone. Well, what is a service? So let's start with a standard, uh, freeform NTP server service. I started off with this Yang, and this NTP freeform service is just saying, okay, we're going to give it a, a namespace here. Uh, with a prefix, I'm going to import uh, a couple of, of types of um, INET types to make sure that I do s handling of things like IP addresses and things like that. And then I also want to make sure that I import this. Um, and this import prefix is basically importing those Yang models. So there's this INET types, which allows us to do like IP address validation, gives us IPv4, IPv6, that kind of thing. So I don't have to write regexes myself. And then this NCS gives us Yang models that we can use to interact with NSO. So what I've started is I've just created this NTP service and I've, I've um, using this entry point and things like that. We don't need to worry too much about this. But what I've said is I want to give, I want to have that NTP server have a name and that name is of type string. 
I'm going to reference the device that I want that NTP server applied to, and that's done through that NCS pathing that we saw earlier. So that's that NCS devices device name, which we saw earlier in the X path, right? So we had devices device name, and then in brackets, we had the device name. Like that, leaf, this leaf ref gives us access to that namespace because of the NCS importing that I did above. And then finally, I want to have one last leaf that's just called NTP server, which is of type INET IPv4 address. So I'm just saying when I enter this, I'm going to call it NTP freeform service, give it a name, a device, and an IPv4 address. That's all I've defined in that Yang model. Okay. So this is that form that I'm using to build my entry, my, my, my automation, my configuration. Step one. Now, how do we translate this from Yang model into workable CLI and um, being able to apply that configuration towards a device? We do that through creating a template. So just like I talked about with NetConf having that XML reply, we need to build a, sem a similar template for that reply inside of our service. And that's where that out format XML comes from. So what I did earlier was created this out format of, of configuration I wanted to apply. You can do the same thing through Pyang, but I did it through XML or NSO because it's easy. This is what that XML template should look like to apply an NTP server towards an iOS device. No disagreement there. I take this template, and actually let me make sure I have both the Yang and the template open here. This config template looks an awful lot like this XML that I generated. There's a few things in here. I've created a variable, so similar to how Jinja and, or, and Ansible does the double curly brackets, um, NSO uses a single curly bracket for variable name. So in, in place of the name, I've created that variable name called device, which by the way, is the name of that leaf ref from my Yang model. I've taken that variable NTP server and replaced the NTP server IP address, which by the way, is the name of that leaf in my end. That's how those two connect. I take the inputs from my Yang model and apply them to my template XML, and then I'm done. Now this is a simple service. We can add Pythonic logic on top of this if we chose to, but it's just a simple service. I don't want to complicate the matter. So I've added my variables and I'm done. I now have a config template and a Yang model. There is a make file. So once I build my Yang model, I have to compile it. And once it's compiled, it has to be put into the packages folder of my NCS uh, instantiation. That's called NTP freeform service. Let's use it. We're going to go to config. I'm going to do NTP freeform service. Boom. I've already created my CLI. I'm going to, it says, no, there's no help here, but possible completions name string. So let's just call it test one. Now you can see I have some basic package stuff that comes with part of NSO, but you can see the reference to the CLI that I have here. I have device and I have NTP server. The CLI flows down from the Yang that I've created. So let's say I want to apply it to a device. I have the completions because I've referenced that inside of NCS to, to call, or I've referenced in the Yang to call the device list from NCS. So I have all the devices in my device list that are populated. Let's do dist router 01 because I have that NTP, the SSH session there. Now what's left? Okay, NTP server. IPv4 address, 10.8.8.8. Enter. Okay. I've now gone out of that, so let's go to, I'm just going to head to the top level and do a show config. Now, this looks different than, than what it was before because I'm not iterating directly through NCS's CLI. I'm doing this through the model or the service that I've created. So that looks a little bit different. If I do a commit, dry run out format CLI. This is what is happening inside of NCS. I'm going to be working through this configuration. So I'm, this is a config that would be applied towards the local node. And here's what's stored in my service manager, uh, my CDB for the service manager here. 
if I look at uh, native, what's going to be applied to the device, which we would expect that distribution router with that data for that NTP server. And then finally, just for uh, uh, completeness, let's look at XML. And you can see that this XML, aside from this, where we're talking about the NTP freeform service namespace, looks exactly like this with those variables filled in. Gwen, can I, can I ask you something here? Sure, sure. Okay, so I'm looking at the left side, and this seems a lot like something that someone would have to apply to uh, if he wanted to do everything uh, with NetConf and Python, right? So it's essentially, let's say, the same model that one would use. Oh, but I'm, I'm noticing that on the XML namespace, there's a, a sort of a URL type of address which points to um, uh, to uh, um, TLF. So this is uh, essentially NSO, right? It's a model mm -hmm. inside the the CMDB of NSO, right? So um, on on the, the on the right side, you pointed at the native earlier. So. This is essentially an, another kind of a native model, right? Only this time you're using NSO and not the device itself, but it's translated one per one, right? Yeah, so so a couple of different things here. To answer the namespace questions, we can have nested namespaces. So yeah, this is because I have to reference the, the NCS namespace to get to that device in my device right. listing, I had to reference that top level NCS namespace. But then right below it, under the NTP, you can see that we're referencing the iOS namespace. It's like so I can have multiple a, a layer on top of it, right? Correct. One layer so that's, that's step... low and the devices are one layer lower, right? Yes. Um, so that's, that's to answer that piece. Now, this native piece and things like that, all that NSO is doing, NSO thinks of everything in the construct of XML or XPath. All that configuration data is stored in XPath. What you're seeing, whether it's a flow down from the CLIs that we're working with or whether it's out format native versus out format whatever, is just a permutation. It's a modification that's being done on that XML data to be displayed in a format that is more readable for us, not for NSO. All right. Um, so, so one of the one of the people that I will recommend who's been doing a lot of work on this. He does not work at Cisco. His name is, is Roman Dodi, and he works um, for uh, oh, yeah. Nokia great. now. Um, he has been doing a lot of work around GNMI and Yang and uh, stuff with it with SROS. Um, Granted, it doesn't necessarily apply to Cisco level certifications, but if you look at some of the stuff he's posted on social on Twitter, you can see the relationships of how he's building flow downs from Yang models to CLI. And that really helps, even though it's it's different commands, it helps cement things a little bit and makes it click. He's doing a tremendous amount of work. Uh, I highly recommend him for a follow if you're interested in more into how the relationships between Yang can be the source of truth for everything else inside of the device. But yeah, so so to answer your, the the last part of that, uh, Giannis is is just that this is this right here is just a permutation of this in a format that we can understand because we're Cisco people. We don't like XML. That's it. Okay, got you. Thank you. So we have not applied this yet. It's it's still in a dry run format. So if we hit commit. And we go back here, as long as we haven't timed out. Boom, that's been applied to the device. Now you might say, well, what's the difference between a service and actual configuration inside of NSO? So if someone gets a wild hair up, and granted, think of, this is a, a very minimal context, but think about it in the larger picture. If someone does a no NTP uh, server 10.8.8.8, and we can verify that it is in fact gone. I'm going a little off of, out of memory here. So if we do service, we do the fake stanza here. Service. 
services. Check sync. Saying it's out of sync. If we do a sync from, when did we do that? Oh, shoot, didn't want to do that. Went too far. We do a devices, device, dist, router, 01. Uh, check sync. We can see that we're out of sync. But we, sh we are able to do a redeploy here, and that's what's the important part. So if we were to do a config, we could do a service. Let's see, was it service? There we go. NTP freeform service. Test one. So now inside of the service, we can do a check sync of this individual service. That's what I was looking for. In it says it's in sync because it's in sync with the CDB, but we can do a deep check sync. Deep check sync. What this is doing is seeing does that service live on the nodes in which we've applied it? And we can see that after doing a deep check sync, we can see that even though it's in sync within the CDB, it's out of sync with the local node. And from here, we can do we can do a redeploy of that service so that in theory, fingers crossed. What's going on? I not do it right. This is what happens when I get off the script. Oh, duh. We should. Nope. I might have to get back to you guys on this one. There's a way that you can redeploy. Is that a reactive redeploy? There's a way that we should be able to redeploy that service and why it's not working. I would need to think about that. But the idea being here, and I know I failed miserably in this, is that if a service is out of sync, we should be able to take that service and rerun that command to redeploy the service against all of those devices. So it'll check where we're in sync and then be able to apply that configuration to, to that device. And why those redeploy, it's gotta be a CLI related thing that I'm missing. We're in drive. Yeah, I'm missing something in the CLI. I'll, I'll I'll get back to you and we'll we'll add that to the show notes, Derek. Don't let me forget. Yeah, um, the last piece of it here, and where I want to show the difference between the uh, the difference in how we build our Yang, is now I've got this NTP service called a list service, and we can see that we've got something very similar here, but in this case, I've got the name. I've got the, the name of the service that I want to apply. I have the leaf devices, but I've done this enumeration. So this region that you're in, I've created three enumerations in there, Americas, APJC, and Amir. Those are the three options that you can choose from your region. Seems simple, simple enough. enough. Now, what I've done here, and this is where the template can get more complex in the logic, and then you can add even Python on top of that, is we see the same idea where we have this device referenced and then we have this NTP namespace, but I've done some conditional logic here that says if region equals America, then commit this IP address. If region is APJC, commit that IP address. And finally, if region's a mirror, commit that IP address. So now what I've done is I've configured logic, business level logic, I, uh, maybe I don't need to know what my different NTP servers are per region, but I can build that so that all someone has knows, oh, that router is in a mirror, apply this NTP server. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to the top and we do NTP list service, and we'll call this test two, 
we can see the same. Um, we have the device and we have region here. So we'll keep this on disk router oh, device, disk router 01, region. You can see I've got three possible completions, Amir, APJC, and Amir. So let's do APJC. That's good. We're going to hit enter. We'll go to the top and we'll do a show config. And see that we're applying that configuration there. What happens if we do a commit dry run? And we'll do out format. Um, I will also commit dry run. We can see what's being applied here. We can see that even though it's referencing that APJC region, it will actually apply that IP address towards the local node. So if we commit, oh yeah, oh that's what I gotta do. I gotta do. One second, guys. Uh, devices, device, this router. One sync. Where's your sync from? See, and this is where you have that database lock. It wouldn't allow me to configure anything because it was out of sync. So it knows that something could po possibly fail if we tried to apply configuration without NCS knowing the full set of truth. So I had to do a sync from. So I pulled the configuration in from the router. And now I can just do that and top commit dry run dry run if i could type so that's going to be applied there let's apply it and here you can see that we've applied that in tp server and we can also um if we wanted to maybe undeploy it we could do a no NTP list service test two and do a show config. Commit dry run. We can see that that would take it away. If we do a commit, we've managed the full life cycle of that service with NSO. And I know that that's a simple example about having just an NTP server. But if you think about that service having multiple touch points, multiple devices that you're configuring, the fact that I could undeploy that service from all those at one time without having any hanging configuration, no leftover firewall rules or stuff on a router, it's a pretty powerful thing to think about. So that's kind of the, the linkage here between, you know, why we worry so much about XML and XPath and a basic flow down of creating a service from XML and YAG and how you can shape what you care about, and that's the important part. NSO is providing the abstraction away from the CLI. So I can put whatever I want to. I, I, like I was demonstrating here, I don't need to worry about NTP servers. I can just say, what region are you? And that's what I care about and have the configuration being applied the way I desire. Okay. And that's it. That's all I've got. Does anybody have any Thanks questions? For spending two and a half hours with me. <laughs> I loved it. I enjoyed myself. Hey, any questions? Anybody have? So this is Abdel. Hi, Quinn. How are you? Um, so I have a second question. Um, with my experience with NSO, it, it used, or maybe I, I don't know if it, it does it right now, but there is no mechanism for feedback of the commit is successful or if there is any errors in, in committing in the device itself. When we commit on production, there's no feedback loop saying the production commit is successful. You have to go to the to the to the router or several types of routers and say, okay, uh, yeah, this configuration has been applied correctly. There's no, um, of course, the NSL has some uh, logic to 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 or um, to to correlate between one configuration and another will affect service, certain services. But the the idea, if you commit any configuration. There is no feedback loop from the device or the set of devices saying, "Okay, this configuration ha, uh, ha, you know, has been applied correctly." Is it? Is there anything right now in latest release of NCS that that have this functionality? I understand that you need to apply like a, a, a top layer logic to do that from Itential, I believe. I think Itential was was going was was having this workflow and feedback comment, but I don't know if they. 
know, created it right now or not. But I don't know. Just uh, if, with, with, for, from your experience, so I wonder if you. Yeah. So, so I, I gather what you're what you're asking is 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 there something that's displayed that says that we've applied this configuration to the devices successfully, like. Yes. More so than just the commit complete, but actually here's, it was committed successfully, uh, something like that? Yes. And it's okay. uh, successfully to the device and the service itself. So basically, if you apply a service, it's a set of devices, L2 VPN, L3 VPN, et cetera. So something mm -hmm. that will give you um, a feedback on the successful application or, uh, of the service or the, the configuration itself. Yeah, so a couple of things there. The, the configuration of the service will always be applied successfully inside of the CVD. Um, now, in terms of, of, of the commit actions, if the template is valid, because you have to realize that there's a lot of things that are going on under the hood here. Even though I've built a service, the service can only exist if, I, if it's supported by the NED. Um, and it knows because of that the the, the configuration actions that go on there. If it's if it fails in the net application, it's if it would fail in like an NCS net sim application, then it wouldn't it won't push that configuration. That's where that atomic commit comes from. Now, there are ways to design to to build logic outside of the or in the service itself to have other things that would come out. I mean, you you have logging that's available inside of NCS where you can pull those logs from and you can have kickers or things that occur after those services that are deployed that do other things that could display either some kind of cli or, or some kind of notification or something along those lines logging to a separate file etc so in terms of is there something natively it says update production successful devices configured da, 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 da. that's not there in ncs but it's because of how it's built you could either do that yourself as part of the, the logic of the service or you could just you know uh, tail off a couple of logs and show that it was applied to these devices. I think it's there's a in if we were to enable logging, there'd be like um, uh, I think it would be probably in in this NCS log, but you could pipe it, you could tail it off to another set of logs um, for device configuration, like a device manager log or something like that. So, so just to break it down for those who do who don't have a lot of experience, right? Um, what Adele asked about was. Uh, at least some simple validation, right, uh, of that the config has been applied, right? So we probably, if you go back a couple of weeks, we did uh, Ansible, and there's some other, you know, uh, Python examples, right? So um, even if it's not inherent in the software, um, in fact, uh, with NSO, is probably the same as, as other, um, you know, uh, applications out there. Um, get in the habit of writing down your validation so you can actually script some kind of validation of your config changes or whatever you're trying to do. Uh, and that's a very important step of it. So if your tool doesn't have that, you can actually uh, just write that. But but that's essentially if um, is what Adele is asking Quinn for, right? Validation, right? Validation that the work that you scripted out has been done and completed successfully, no errors. Or if there's errors, show those errors. So. I know there is there is also a part of NSL of deploying or provisioning a service is based on the atomicity principle of all or nothing. So basically, if I if the service is deployed or it's not deployed, basically if one device is, you know, uh, has an app, you know, it's down or there is a flapping WAN link or or there is something that is. Uh, like um, like a firewall in the between that that actually uh, you know preventing for for deploying that service on what particular router or particular switch or whatever the device we took we're talking about in that part, in, within the scope of that service the deployment will not won't happen in general of the service but it will if every every device is reachable and the service will you know the deployment itself but this is one aspect that will maybe from from the admin point of view will assure him or her that this is the deployment has been successful i was um you know when when i was deploying in so and, and working with, with one of one of service providers that they, 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 they there was it was a raised question around okay because this is only a provisioning engine is not a like it, it doesn't have any mechanism to check the status of any device uh, so that basically it's just 
push the configuration if it everything is fine that's that's okay if anything is not working properly you know this configuration introduced another uh, another problem in a, in, a, in in another service it doesn't really the nso is is out of that loop it's just he deployed deploy the service it was successful i don't I, I like i don't care about anything else so right anyway sorry sorry for the, for, for, for the no, no, thank no, you that, thank that, you for that, elaborating on that yeah, yeah no that's good and, and that's that just kind of reiterates the point of of saying configuration level assurance or configuration assurance versus experience assurance or end user assurance um that's why you know being able to incorporate nso as part of a larger set of of tools um so going back to my my cicd example we would use nso to do the orchestration and automation of that configuration but then we pass it off on a separate task in the pipeline to run something like pi ats to do some validation has that end service done what it really is meant to do? Do we still have the BGP underlay? Do we still have all of the things that we need for that service to function correctly from a user experience level, not a configuration level? So yes, and, and you could write those checks in the Python logic of the service itself, but that's where you have to be cognizant of the level of um, locking that the database will be doing if, if i'm running a long if i'm running a long tail action uh or service i'm sorry and then have to do additional python stuff to do assurance at the end of it i've locked that database for a long time and depending on the churn of your environment that may or may not be a big issue that's actually a good point yeah that's actually a good point you need to take into consideration in when you val when you run this validation uh, database login as well. So so thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, actually, th that sort of validation doesn't really happen in these sort of tools. I mean, you mentioned Pyatt, but I, I would call this not uh, experience uh, level management, but service level management, which means that uh, as an engineer, you may have the conception of a service in its totality, which consists of the network and uh, several parts of uh, network services and perhaps computing services as well and other stuff. And you know that the, this whole thing is working when you are doing certain checks and you can verify it's working. This could be done with Pyatt or you could be using other tools as well, like Nudges or stuff like that. But I think Pyatt is in the only position, Pyatt, yes, sorry, Simming would be mad at me for that kind of <laughs> pronunciation. So uh, PyATS is in the only position to really uh, write the logic of uh, tests like that and uh, really portray uh, the stats of the network as a single variable. You know, it's green or red, so, something like that. I don't, I don't think any other tool. It's not the fault of NSO uh, it on itself. Uh, no, no other tool that does this sort of thing can can apply that logic. But you could perhaps write something that could use NSO to remedy that. You know. So, so just just example. Well, this actually goes back months and months, right? I think I actually had a conversation with Quinn. Uh, twenty twenty was a long year, but somewhere in twenty twenty, where we start talking about the, I was comparing uh, uh, Ansible to NSO, and what Quinn uh, uh, politely told me is that, that why compare? Them, right? There's there's use case for both of them, and they can complement each other, right? So that's why I changed my article and started writing ways to, to complement it. And this this goes in another use case, right? You can use NSO. You already know from based on on what he just demoed, the, the, the strength of, of at least uh, automation within uh, networking and, and networking devices, right, uh, of NSO. But the other factors that, that play a role in your, your automated environment, um, orchestrated environment, what have you, would be the role of other tools that can help come in like Pi ETS or whatever that, that can validate, do your validation for you, right? So you can leverage other things, but but no one's saying that NSO is the end-all be-all, right, for, for network uh, automation. Um, there's a, quite an ecosystem out there that now watching, I mean, I can honestly say that I've done a lot of test cases with, with NSO, nothing... Um, really expansive right and i haven't deployed it uh, in, in in a production environment but looking at uh this example and looking at uh how quinn just explained it all you guys can uh, and, and 
you know, comment if you can, but you guys can actually see the strength and benefit of NSO and how it, it would be better at some things than most tools are. And that's understanding Cisco devices right off the bat. I was, I was shocked at some point where he mentioned that uh, the northbound app is where the software itself is, is based on. It's at the same level that you would enter with other tools like Ansible or REST API, essentially, or northbound. Well, you can use your own tool to talk to this API. So uh, you can do the, uh, this at the same level that the NSO does it. So this really unlocks a whole lot of potential there. In fact, that, that pipeline uh, the use case that I keep talking about was pushing the configuration via Ansible playbooks to using the NSO module, which was just taking the YAML file and converting it to JSON RPC payload and sending it to a RESTConf URI. So it's all it's all inter it's all interconnected at some point. But because you have that northbound ability, you can either extend um, the capabilities and use NSO as part of a larger tool chain, or because of the engines underneath it, you can expand it inside of the you know in the hood, I guess, um, you know, to, whether you want to, to build a logic in the service itself or in, in NCS or whether you want to expand it as part of a larger pipeline and tool chain. And Derek's on mute. I am on mute. So I want to thank you guys for all joining this afternoon. Um, to be honest with you, I am way more appreciative of the time that, that Quinn just spent dropping knowledge. I mean, <laughs> he really put a lot of information out there, which is great. I'm going to go ahead and chop this up just so you know, and then I'm going to share it uh, this week. Um, I'm, I'm grateful that the Greek God of automation has joined as well. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, this is the first time I've actually spoken to him, uh, I guess, um, face to face, however you want to say this, but I want to bring him on because uh, he is in quite a, he's done in quite a bit in automation and he has a mindset. I mean, you can tell by the, the things he put online and about the solutions that he comments on uh, that he does have a deep understanding of automation, but he, not only that, he does have a great vision, right, of where automation is going. So I want to get him back in. Um, I want you guys to hammer him with hard questions. Abdel, you better join. Um, but again, I want to thank you guys yeah, for this. Yeah. And, and these videos will be out this week. I'm a little slow, so I'm not going to say tomorrow, but I, I work on cutting them up and, and actually putting out notes and everything. And also, uh, uh, I'm probably going to the, the deck. Uh, I, I'll talk to Quinn about see what we can do as far as a PDF or something like that. I, I, can, I can I can like push it to a GitHub repo or something. So you get the PDF and then the starter files and stuff like that. Oh, great. Now you guys can start getting familiar with GitHub. <laughs> but uh, all right. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Any any last remaining questions? All right, Quinn, I owe you one. And Greek guy. Thank you, Quinn. I, Thanks, I, 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 no worries. You're going to see a meme on you when I when I when I bring you in. Uh, all right, guys, <laughs> I talk to you later. Enjoy your Saturday. Thank Bye, you, guys. Mr. Quinn. Yeah. See you all. Thank Go you. Bye-bye. Do you understand?